afternoon's session is uh, focused around a, a guest uh, speaker, uh, Charlie Arnott. Peter, thank you for that. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. It is a great pleasure and a privilege to be with you. I want to thank Annabelle for all of her great work in uh, coordinating. And Catherine, thank you for the kind invitation to, uh, to come over and spend some time in, in WA. This afternoon, uh, I am going to present a little bit of information during the uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation and then really do encourage your very candid and open questions. Uh, I hope that this session is very interactive. I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to uh, explore the issues and explore the areas that are most relevant to you. And so please feel free to ask any question that you'd like. Uh, I want to make sure that we have uh, a discussion that is very robust. So feel free at any point in time to jump in and uh, ask a question. So we're going to talk about trust in general, but I also want to focus a little bit this afternoon on the power of farmers and women in building trust and how those two groups in particular have uh, a level of power and a level of, of credibility uh, that perhaps might be valuable to you and to your work uh, at DAFWA. We know that there is a growing gap and a continual gap in consumer understanding and trust uh, in today's food system. Most consumers don't understand how food is produced in today's systems, and the less they understand, unfortunately, the more likely it is that the social license that we need to protect the freedom of, to operate for those in agriculture will be challenged. Uh, consumers, we know, are both generationally and geographically removed uh, from agriculture and farming, and that creates a challenge. And some would like us to simply turn back the clock. I'm sure there's something that you hear frequently. If we could just go back to the way it used to be, uh, things would be just fine. Now, no one's ever quite able to articulate the specific year we should go back to, uh, but they'd all like us to go back to some previous time uh, when things were better, things were simpler. It just depends on what time that happens to be for you. But, you know, comparing today's farming with that iconic image of, of agriculture is really like comparing a new car with the, with the classic Toyota Land Cruiser. Uh, nothing wrong about the Toyota Land Cruiser. Obviously, it's a, an iconic uh, vehicle that provides a great deal of service, but it doesn't have any of the technology that make today's vehicles better. Uh, no power steering, air conditioning, no computer. And so it simply is not the right vehicle for today just as yesterday's agriculture is not the right agriculture for what we need today. The challenge is, though, because of our application of technology, consolidation and integration, and the fact that consumers are increasingly removed from who we are and what we do, it's created that erosion of trust uh, because they aren't as familiar, they aren't as comfortable uh, with how we operate in agriculture and food today. But times have changed for very, very good reasons. Uh, the systems that we use today allow us to produce more using less and to produce more, having less impact on the environment in providing better care for animals and providing more affordable food than we've ever done before. But if we take a look back, you get a little better appreciation of, again, why people are, are so removed and we see the ongoing challenges that we see. Uh, a bit more than a century ago, about 14% of Australia's population had some direct connection to agriculture. So it's very easy to understand at that point in time why people feel more connected and a greater relationship to those who are involved in food and farming. But today, about 134,000 farming businesses out of 22.8 million residents, an extremely small portion of the population has any connection. But one farmer produces enough to feed 600 people around the world. Most of that, of course, particularly in WA, being exported. So people continue to get further removed, they have less understanding, they have less relationship, and less connection with what takes place in food and agriculture today, and that results in that ongoing erosion. So what we hear from consumers is they sense some kind of change. They understand something is different, but they don't understand what it is. And it's that lack of understanding that creates an information vacuum. And like any other vacuum, the information vacuum will be filled. The only question is who's going to fill it and with what? And that's really the opportunity for us to be more engaged in that conversation, more engaged in that dialogue. But it's about giving people the information that they're interested in knowing when they're interested in knowing it. It's not about simply educating them. Uh, as I shared earlier today with Annabelle, I came from a meeting last week where some folks were talking about research they'd done recently in Canada, where they asked consumers if they wanted to learn more about farming, and the response was pretty low. And they asked people if they wanted to know more, and the, answer, and the response was pretty high. So people are interested in knowing more, but they're not interested in learning more. No one's interested in being educated. They're interested in being engaged. And so it's a different process. It's a different way for us to think about 
how we can engage and provide the information that's relevant to people when they have an interest. So closing that gap, bridging that gap between who we used to be, who we are today, and creating that level of consumer trust requires us to engage in communication that is ethically grounded, scientifically verified, and assuring that our practices are still economically viable. But it's understanding the balance of those and how we communicate effectively using all three of those platforms that will be crucially important for us to think about how we build trust in today's farming and today's food system. So how do we build trust? How do we protect our freedom to operate in this new environment? That's really the fundamental question that we'd like to spend some time uh, talking about and addressing this afternoon. What you're seeing on the screen here is the peer-reviewed and published uh, trust model that we talk about frequently at the Center for Food Integrity. And we start with freedom to operate in the bottom right-hand corner. And the reason we start with that is we know that that's the issue that is most crucial to our stakeholders. That's the thing that most of our stakeholders are interested in. What can we do? How can we help them uh, protect their freedom to operate? How do we support their success? Uh, and in today's environment, that requires us to consistently earn and maintain a social license. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about social license, uh, what it is and what we can do to maintain it. And we define it as the privilege of operating with minimal formalized restrictions based on maintaining public trust. If the public trusts us to do what's right, they won't feel the need to impose more social control. They'll go ahead and allow us to continue to do what we do in food and farming. And we've seen social control imposed through legislation, regulation, or today more frequently through market intervention, uh, where market forces or social forces will step in and say, we don't believe that particular activity is consistent with social expectations. We're going to impose more social control. And public trust is a belief that our activities are consistent with social expectations, the values of the community, and other stakeholders. Now, one of the challenges for those of us who work directly in agriculture is that the social expectations of our immediate stakeholders may not be the social expectations of the broader public. And so what we can do is help our stakeholders understand, perhaps, those evolving social expectations for how food is produced, uh, how we care for the land, and how we care for our animals as well. But I'd like to be able to, to use this illustration to make what I hope is a fairly compelling economic case for investing in social license. Uh, because at the end of the day, if there's not economic justification for it, it's pretty difficult to continue to uh, uh, articulate why you should continue to invest in and support social license. So on the left hand, you see there that again, that social license provides a system that is more flexible, responsive, and lower cost. But you're only granted that social license if you operate in a way consistent with the ethics, values, and expectations of your stakeholders. And you're able to demonstrate there's some kind of self-regulatory mechanism in place to assure that you consistently meet their expectations. So I'm going to give you two examples of when social license has been lost and you cross a tipping point, and then you move to social control, which is much more rigid, much more bureaucratic, and higher cost, all about regulation, legislation, litigation, and compliance. Now, one is from my personal experience. Uh, I spent 11 years as vice president of a large integrated swine company, pork company in the United States. Uh, we were the first to take Wall Street money and employ it in animal agriculture in a very uh, significant way. At our fastest, we were building a barn and a quarter a day. Uh, we added 80,000 sows, 1,500 employees, and a packing plant in about 18 months. But not everything went well. Uh, we had a few hiccups along the way, including some environmental incidents. And so the state of Missouri came in and said, you know what, you have violated the public trust. We no longer trust you to manage the nutrients from swine waste, so we're going to take away your social license, so we're going to replace it with more social control. They changed the entire regulatory scheme for how animal agriculture operated in that state because of the incidents that we had. And we knew from our benchmarking service that our cost was now six times the cost of our out-of-state competitors for managing the environment. So we made ourselves less competitive economically because we lost the social license. And of course, live export is the one that is, is most relevant uh, in WA, where you clearly saw that the live export of cattle was something where you'd enjoyed some social license. There was the video, which became the tipping point, And all of a sudden, social control was imposed. And you lost the opportunity to export live cattle. 
and the economic consequences of that were and continue to be fairly significant. So if this is not an act of altruism, it's enlightened self-interest. So this is about helping people understand the economic value of investing in social license. Now, if you were to model this economically, you'd say, well, we're going to invest the last dollar of avoided cost. That would be how much you should spend on social license. The problem is you never know what that last dollar is until you've crossed the tipping point, and then it's too late. So you have to make some calculated uh, estimates about what we should invest and what the value of social license is, depending upon how close you think you're getting to the tipping point, what the impact would be of losing social license, uh, and what the reach would be of losing social license on any given particular issue. So as I mentioned before, that social license is based on maintaining trust. So we wanted to know what does it take to build trust? And that's where we actually began our research. Uh, we started in partnership with Steve Sapp from Iowa State University, and we began with a meta-analysis of 21 different pieces of research on trust in food. We wanted to see if we could uncover some common drivers. And in each of those 21 pieces of research, we identified the three drivers you see there on the left-hand side of the screen. At the very bottom, it's influential others, and that includes two groups. It's your family and friends, those in your immediate social circle, as well as credentialed individuals whose opinions you respect. And that really is dependent upon the issue. Uh, if it's a question about food safety, it might be a dietitian or it might be your doctor. If it's a question about animal care, it's likely to be a veterinarian. So who that, it, uh, who that influential other is really depends on the question at hand. The second element in building trust is competency. That's our technical capacity, the science, and skills. And really across the board in agriculture, that's where we historically have spent most of our time talking about who we are and what we do. And I clearly uh, was involved in that in the company that I worked for. I could prove where every pound of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus on that farm went. And clearly, if I gave people that information, I believe that that should be sufficient for them to trust us. And our historical view has been people will be logical and they'll be rational, and if we simply give them enough information, they'll come to our side of the argument. And if they've not come to our side of the argument, it must mean we've not given them the right information. So we commission more science. And if they still haven't come to our side of the argument, we commission more science. And we repeat that cycle over and over and over again under the assumption that it's competency that will drive trust. The third element in building trust is confidence. That's the perception of shared values and ethics. In other words, can I count on you to do what's right as I define it? So once we'd identified that those were the three primary drivers for trust, we then commissioned a survey of 6,000 US consumers over the course of three years, asking them about food safety, animal care, on-farm sustainability, worker health and safety, a whole range of different issues. And as a part of that, we discovered that shared values are three to five times more important in building trust than demonstrating our technical skills. Now that's a, a real mind shift for those of us in food and in agriculture because again, historically, we've really counted on science as being the primary driver for building trust. Now, science is crucial in building trust and maintaining public support, but it isn't the driver. The driver for building public support in who we are and what we do today is demonstrating that we share the values of the public. And in some qualitative research that we were conducting about the same time across the states, what we heard consistently from consumers was, I trust farmers, but I'm not sure that what you're doing is still farming. I don't like the size and scale. I don't like your use of technology. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with non-family non labor. And so while I think farmers are really good people, I'm not sure that what you're doing today still qualifies as farming. So we're gonna go back in just a little bit and talk about how we can address that specific problem. How can we help people understand that yes, our systems have changed, but the values of those involved in agriculture are as strong as they've ever been. That they can still count on us to do what's right, even though we do it in different ways than we've done historically. That's the big challenge. So what does it mean for us? They really don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. It's pretty simple. But what they're questioning today is not whether or not we know what we're doing, but whether or not we're committed to doing what's right. That's the fundamental question that we're getting from consumers that challenges our social license and our freedom to operate.
Okay, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk some about values and ethics in our science-based culture and why our message gets lost in translation. And when I'm talking about our, our science-based culture, I'm really referring to agriculture because, again, we are steeped in science. And please do not misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm not in any way suggesting we abandon science. I am suggesting it has to play a different role in our public outreach if we're going to build trust in who we are and what we do. Now, we know from some research that there are five basic values that transcend culture and transcend geography. Compassion, responsibility, respect, fairness, and truth. Now, how those are manifested is culturally specific. But those five values kind of transcend culture and transcend geography. And I'm going to spend a little time talking about how sometimes we unintentionally undermine our own credibility simply by how we talk about who we are and what we do. And I'm going to use Kohlberg's moral hierarchy as a way to illustrate that. Uh, Lawrence Kohlberg was a brilliant social psychologist at the Uni University of Chicago in the 1960s who spent his entire career studying ethical decision making. He wanted to know when people are faced with an ethical or a moral dilemma, what's the context in which they consider that question and how do they go about making their decision? And he gave thousands of people all around the world the Heinz dilemma to come up with his moral hierarchy which has three levels and six stages. So level one, direct impact on me, the first stage, punishment and obedience. I'm going to clean my room because if I don't, mom's going to be mad at me. Second, personal rewards orientation. What's in it for me? I'm going to make all of my decisions based on what's in it for me. You move to level two, societal expectations, the good boy, nice girl orientation. What will people think about me or say about me based on what I do? Then the law and order orientation. I'll be in compliance. Compliance should be sufficient. If I'm in compliance, you should leave me alone. Then to the principle driven level, first stage there, social contract, what's in the best interest of the group. And then finally, a commitment to universal ethical principles, things like compassion, responsibility, respect, fairness, and truth. Now, has anyone in agriculture ever said, well, of course we take care of the land and animals because that's when we get the best return on our investment? Count me guilty. I've said it before. Unfortunately, the implied message in that is, if something else gives me a better ROI, I'll do that. Because the driver for my behavior is maximizing the return on my investment. I'm not doing it because it's the right thing to do. I'm doing it because it's in my best personal interest. Or have we said, we're in compliance with all environmental, welfare, and employment laws. Leave us alone. Or are we willing to say, as a farmer, I understand that I have an ethical obligation to employees, to the environment, to the animals, and to my community. And here's what we do every single day to live up to that obligation on our farm. Here's the best part about Colbert's moral hierarchy. If you're working with good farm businesses that are committed to doing the right things, it costs nothing to move from the very bottom to the very top. You don't have to change your SOPs. You don't have to make any capital investments. You have to change how you think and how you communicate. It's a shift in mindset. My belief is that the ethical high ground belongs to farmers. So let's claim it. Let's claim it and not allow others to claim it on our behalf and not talk about the fact that we're doing the only reason we're doing things is because that's when we maximize profit. I mean, if farmers were primarily interested and only interested in maximizing profit, most of them would have probably chosen something other than farming, right? They choose to be involved in agriculture because they've got a passion for what they do. So let's claim the ethical high ground because it rightfully belongs to those in agriculture. Don't let it be usurped uh, by others. So when we talk about balancing for success at CFI, we use a triangle as the illustration for that because of its great structural integrity. And since we know shared values are three to five times more important than competency in building trust, that's where we build the foundation of the triangle, with our ability to demonstrate that we understand and support the values that are important to the public. Things like compassion, responsibility, respect, fairness, and truth. The second side of the triangle, again, is about scientific verification, making sure that we have the objective, measurable, repeatable claim uh, data to prove the claims that we're making. And then finally, it's about being economically viable. Because at the end of the day, if we're not economically viable, we're not truly sustainable. But here's where we get that public conversation confused again. Most of the questions that we get today come at the base of the triangle. Should you house animals the way you're housing them? Should you export live cattle? 
Should you use GM? Should you use those crop protection chemicals? And our historical response has been, well, science says we can. Can and should are not the same question. Can is a question about competency. Should is a question about values and ethics. So society will tell us whether or not we should. Science will tell us whether or not we can. So we have to make sure we understand the difference because we can't substitute scientific verification for ethical justification. They're very different concepts. Now, I think we've got great ethical reasons for doing what we're doing. And if we don't, then we really ought to be the first ones to take a look at that. Because when we give information about economics or science, we increase people's knowledge, but we may do absolutely nothing to change how they feel or what they believe. And people are much more likely to act on how they feel and what they believe than on what they know. So we have to make sure that we communicate that our practices are ethically grounded, scientifically verified, and economically viable, but we've got to answer the should question, not just the can question. Because we used to believe that, that progress was inevitable. Today, progress is possible, but only if we build public support. That's the crucial element for us going forward. Seems painfully obvious when Einstein says it, but we really can't solve problems using the same thinking we used when we created them. So it requires a shift in mindset. It requires a change in how we think if we're going to create changes that actually begin to result in improvements and begin to solve these problems and build social license for who we are and what we do. So we put together what we hope is a relatively simple integrated trust building model. And it starts on the left-hand side. And I hope this is something that you can continue to use uh, and use with their, your stakeholders who count on you for counsel. But it starts by making sure that our practices are ethically grounded. Have we taken the time to write down what we stand for, what we believe, and what we're committed to doing? Have you had a chance to have that conversation with those stakeholders with whom you work? We know that's three to five times more important than demonstrating competency, so taking the time to write that down is crucially important. On the far right, external manifestation, that tends to be where we're fairly strong in agriculture. Historically, we've been pretty good with best practices, education, and certification programs. And kind of the bold new frontier for us, as we look at emerging communication technology and the new social pressure on what's happening in food and agriculture, is stakeholder engagement. Have we identified and mapped those stakeholders who truly control social license? It's not the public at large. The public at large is generally uninformed and relatively unconcerned about our issues. But who are those stakeholders? Is it those in the local community that are concerned about your impact on resources? Is it your customers that are concerned about your supply and its possible impact on their brand? Uh, is it NGOs who have a particular interest in any specific issue? And have you taken the time to identify them and determine whether or not you have the opportunity for meaningful engagement? With some you will and with others you will not. Uh, if they are dogmatic, if they're committed to uh, abolition, you won't be able to engage with them. If they're pragmatic and they're interested in reasonable reform, perhaps you can. But it's taking the time to map those stakeholders, determining which ones have the greatest impact on social license, and then developing a specific engagement strategy to allow you to be successful going forward. Because, of course, what we continue to see in the states from our research is really lack of support for today's food system. Uh, every year heading into the political election, the Gallup company, the, the polling company, will ask U.S. citizens, do you believe the, the country is headed in the right direction or on the wrong track? So last year, we asked them the exact same question about the food system. Do you believe the food system is on the right direction or on the wrong track? And what you can see is it's anything but a glowing endorsement. 31% said they felt it was on the wrong track. 30% said in the right direction. 39% were unsure. It's also really important to recognize there are meaningful and significant gender differences when it comes to food. Nearly 50% of women said they were unsure about whether the food system is headed in the right direction or on the wrong track. These are the core people who make decisions about food. These are the people that are having more conversations about food, the people that buy food, the people that serve food, the people that are concerned about what they provide for their children. So making sure we have that connection and that level of support with women in particular is crucially important. Nearly 40% of men said they thought it was headed in the right direction. And those early adopters, those who are more likely to be writing about, blogging about, talking about food system issues, roughly 40% of them believe the food system is on the wrong track. So we've got our work cut out for us in terms of building that level of, of public support, building that trust that protects the social license 
and the freedom to operate for those who are involved in farming and agriculture. It's a bit of an uphill climb, but I'm convinced it's something we can accomplish if we embrace new values-based approaches to outreach. So that takes me to a specific initiative uh, that we put in place to actually begin to make that happen. Uh, the woman on you see there on the screen is Annie Link. She's a dairy farmer from Alto, Michigan. And so what we knew the challenge was from our qualitative research was closing that gap when people said, we trust farmers, but we're not sure what you're doing is still farming. How could we give them the opportunity to see that, yes, our systems have changed, but our commitment to do what's right has never been stronger? How can we get them an opportunity to actually meet and engage with farmers today so that we can be transparent about showing the systems but give people the opportunity to talk about their values. So we came up with a program we call Farmers Feed Us, and we'll talk about the details of that in just a moment. But the goal was to be very transparent in showing today's farming systems, to not shy away from size or scale, not shy away from our use of technology, but to make sure that what farmers communicated were their values. So we captured a few videos. We wanted to make sure none of them were more than about 90 seconds because no one's interested in more than that much information. And then we tested them with some focus groups. So we brought together a group of early adopting women in Minneapolis and gave them the first 30 minutes to spend time telling us everything they hate about today's food system. So they were good and lathered up by the end of that 30 minutes and they were all convinced that everything in today's food system was unhealthy, unethical, unsustainable. And then we decided we were going to show them a video. And we picked a video that we thought would be uh, challenging for us to find a way to get them to connect. So we provided them a video of a turkey grower. So first of all, he's a contract grower. So that raises questions about whether or not he's technically a farmer, since these are not his animals. Uh, he's raising turkeys, so he's got thousands, if not tens of thousands of birds in this barn. So he's going to be very large scale, and he's going to have lots of animals in the barn. And he talks very clearly about what happens. All of the images we show are very transparent. So while we're showing this farming operation, we're showing all the birds, we're showing the size and scale, what he talks about are four values that are core to him in an interview. He talks about producing safe food, about caring for the environment, about protecting the animals, and about contributing to his community. And he's in the barn with his wife and his two kids and talking about those values while we show everything about today's food system. So we get done with the video and we ask the focus group, what do you think? And the initial feedback was, you know, when I saw all those birds, it made me uncomfortable. I'm not sure I like that, but I really like him. And I like him enough that I think he'll do the right thing. And so we don't have to give them details about stocking density or cortisol scores or nutrition information. What we have to do is give them permission to believe that he's going to do the right thing and be transparent in an authentic way so they can actually see what's happening. So I'm going to give you a chance to see what we did with Annie and Annie Link's video, okay? So they milk about 1,300 cows a day. And by any standard from conversations in U.S. consumers, they would define that in their minds as a factory farm, right? This isn't somebody's small operation. But Annie's going to talk about their commitment and the history of their farm and their commitment to do what's right. So let's take a look at Annie Link's video. My great grandpa came from Quinn Sterling, all the way to Alto, Michigan, and he started working for the dairy farm down the road. And after only 11 years, he ended up marrying the farmer's daughter. Together, they bought the 90 acres that our farm sits on now. In 1915, Two Lane Dairy Farms was established. My grandpa, Joe, took over the farm from there, and now my dad and my two uncles own the farm. Now, my husband and I and a couple other members of the fourth generation are starting to take a more active role. My husband and I have three children. They come to the farm and help me take care of the calves and help out with chores around here. On our farm, we have 1,250 cows that we milk three times every day. We treat our cows like princesses. We know that the happier, the more comfortable our cows are, the healthier they're going to be, and that is going to mean a safe and quality milk. One of the things we do for the cows is we have a nutritionist who's here checking on our cows two to three times a week. And he actually does milk samples and feed samples, and from there, he can help us decide what kinds of foods that we should be feeding the cows. 
the healthier the cows eat, the healthier they're going to be, the better milk they're going to give us, better quality milk they're going to give us. I know that I'm the person I am today because of growing up on a farm. I feel very blessed to have this opportunity and I can't wait to extend this opportunity to my children. So that's Annie's dairy, and we've shown that over the last couple of weeks. We did some focus groups on, on some other issues, and we showed them some videos from BP. We showed them some videos from IBM. We showed them Annie's video, and they love Annie uh, because Annie's very personable. She's very engaging. Uh, you know, some of the feedback was, I can identify with her. She could be my friend. And if, they, if they've got that perception of Annie, then Annie has the opportunity because she's established that shared values connection to provide more information. But Annie didn't talk about the nutrition increasing productivity. Annie talked about making sure the cows were well cared for and that healthy cows mean healthy milk. So she was talking about what was important to the consumers, not what's important to her. So it wasn't about increased efficiency, it wasn't increased productivity, it was this system allows us to do what's right for you. You, the person who controls our social license. So, once we began to, to have that idea, we realized, okay, we can put lots of information on the internet, but if nobody comes to look at it, who cares? So how do we actually get people to engage? So we created a sweepstakes where people had the opportunity to win free groceries for a year if they would come and watch the video. But they had to actually watch the video in order to register. So we had trivia questions, we made it very engaging, we made it very fun. Uh, we've done this in 13 states. We've got over 100 farmers uh, featured on the Farmers Feed Us YouTube channel. We created that website to drive consumer interest in education uh, and really then gave people the opportunity to understand that, yes, systems have changed, but the farmers can tell their story in a very compelling and believable way. And it was everything from dairy to corn to soy to mushrooms to watermelon uh, not every product, certainly, that uh, agriculture produces, but a very wide range of products. And we were very pleased with the results. In 13 states, we had over a million seven consumer registrations. Uh, over 117,000 consumers have opted in for an ongoing newsletter. So we have a chance to engage with them every single month and give them more information about agriculture, food, and encourage them to engage with us on our Best Food Facts website as well. Um, almost 15 million earned media impressions. And this is the only project I've been involved in in my 25 years of communication where every single story was positive. Uh, never seen that happen before. So every single story about the farmers was positive because they were giving away groceries and they were talking about their values. Uh, 42 million plus paid media impressions and almost 32,000 social media friends have now uh, engaged with us in various forms. So what? Did we move the needle? Did we make a difference? So we surveyed uh, almost 6,000 of those folks who'd been to the websites and registered across the 13 different states to see whether or not we'd had any impact uh, on their uh, views and attitudes toward farming. So we asked them the competency question, okay, I found the information about agriculture very informative or somewhat informative. 91.2% said they found it very or somewhat informative. Here's the key one in terms of the values question, I found the farmers featured to be approachable, knowledgeable, and the kind of people I want producing my food. In other words, someone who shares my values. 94.1% either somewhat or strongly agreed with that statement. The information enhanced my perception of agriculture and farmers in my state. 88.6% strongly or somewhat agreed with that statement. So we really believe that it was making a difference in terms of our ability to connect with consumers in a way that was meaningful for them. And that's one of several different kinds of programs that we execute uh, through the Center for Food Integrity to build trust in agriculture, to build trust in food. But the target audience that we're trying to reach with that really is women. Because again, those are the people that are more concerned about food issues, they're engaged in food issues, and they have a higher level of skepticism. Uh, because of their role as purchasers and providers, particularly for children. So the most compelling and effective spokespeople for building support for food and agriculture, no surprise, farmers, but especially women. 
whenever we had the opportunity to identify a, a, a woman farmer who was going to be able to participate in Farmers Feed Us, we took advantage of that opportunity because of the greater likelihood of the perception of shared values. When consumers believe that Annie Link could be my friend, then we have the opportunity to connect with them in a way that is more meaningful. So that's kind of a high level overview of, of our trust model, of the work that we do at the Center for Food Integrity, and then one brief illustration of how we've actually taken that theory, that information, that model, and applied it in programming in order to build trust in today's food and farming. So with that, I want to thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity of making the presentation, and I would be uh, very pleased to open it up for questions and comments.